just now 9 o'clock, and I want to remind everybody uh, to make sure that you grab a copy of the bulletin and the sermon notes. Uh, and of course, in the bulletin, we have our usual information about things going on, classes, and so forth. And I wanted to uh, make some uh, notes about the prayer list. And one of those things is uh, Diana Fear is undergoing some tests, so we want to keep uh, her in our prayers. That those test results will come out good. Uh, Dave Avery had some tests recently, and come to find out he's not going to die yet. So, <laughs> no. In other words, uh, he, he, he does have some health issues, but they're not life-threatening, so they're going to see what they can do to take care of him. Dave is here today, so you can go ahead and and ask him all about that. We also want to pray for another Dave, who is Debbie's sister's husband. He had a stint put in, and he's complaining of some health issues, I guess some pains or something, and he's refusing to go to the doctor. And you know what, guys? Yeah, we're not gonna go to the doctor until we absolutely positively need to. So anyway, pray, pray for that situation. Anything else we wanna mention for the prayer list? It is good to see everybody out, um, and again, uh, I want to make mention of our uh, self-serve Lord's Supper. If you uh, haven't grabbed one of those, uh, please do so before uh, assembly begins. Any other announcements we want to make note of? Okay, let's go ahead and have a word. <clears throat> Most Holy Father, dear God, Father, we want to thank you for blessing us with another day. Father, as we... Uh, are now dealing with all the rains that are moving into our state over the last several days. We've uh, only been experiencing different uh, situations involving the weather. Uh, there have been homes in our state that have uh, suffered severe damage. There have been uh, mudslides and floodings. And we pray for those people and their struggles. Father, we also uh, pray for the leaders in our state that they would plan well uh, to save uh, water for future use. And Father, we uh, ask that you'll bless um, each and every one of us as we do our best to follow your will. Father, we also want to pray uh, for those people we especially mentioned this morning, uh, Dave and Dave, and also Diana. And Father, we pray that you will be with them and whatever health issues they have or the test coming up. And Father, we pray you'll bless them. Again, Father, we pray for your blessings in our assembly today. In Jesus' name.
morning. Good morning. Uh, well, God bless the rain. We uh, certainly prayed for it for the last several years. Yeah. Hard, and we got it. So uh, I guess we just have to be grateful for what we got. And, and like Chuck said earlier, we <coughs> pray for all those out there that are struggling with uh, the fruitful bounty. And uh, um, yeah, in the future, hopefully we can do a better job of uh, salvaging it and saving it. Maybe we get that sand built up in our Oh, well, anyway. Yeah. We are here to give thanks for the gifts that, uh, that the Lord has given us in the life um, and death of his son. So uh, let's uh, give thanks for the wonderful gift of his body. <clears throat> Lord God, thank you for the gift of your son and all the gifts that you work through him and through the Holy Spirit in our lives every day. It is with a humble heart that we accept this token of his body. thanks for the uh, fruit of the vine. Lord, once again, we humbly accept this token that represents the lifeblood that your son shed so many years ago for us. And it is with grateful and humble hearts that we accept this. In Christ's name we pray. Well, even though we uh, know that uh, the church is, is uh, being sold, we still have business to attend to. Um, so that uh, we have to uh, deep, dig deep and give a little bit of the gifts that God has, has given us in, in our lives and, and uh, give back a little to this body. So we uh, have the box in the back. If anybody wants to, uh, at this time, um, put a little bit of something special in there, um, we do uh, absolutely appreciate that. And, let's, and keep honoring the Lord in this beautiful house and, uh, until it is with another loving uh, family. And uh, let's uh, go, to the, go to the Lord with that. <clears throat> Lord God, thank you for all the wonderful years that this establishment and this house has been here for us. Uh, we do not take for granted all of the works that you do in our lives every day, and it is with a humble heart that we give back just a little of ourselves in memory of you and your wonderful, beautiful son. And it is in yours and his holy name we pray. Amen. Jesus. 
You like that? I struggled to find a good picture for today. I thought that kind of worked and I, you know, anyway. Hello again. It's good to see again everybody out. I'm glad you braved the weather. Prayerfully, after the storms we've had, everyone still has power of some sort. The only thing I've been dealing with is intermittent internet, and I can live with that. But um, prayerfully, everyone's doing okay. There's a story that involves a preacher who was on his way out to make some visits to some church members. And as he's walking along the street, he comes upon a boy who's trying to sell a lawnmower. So the preacher asks the boy, how much do you want for the mower? The boy says, I want just enough money so that I could buy a bicycle. After thinking a minute, the preacher asked, well, will you take $50 for it? The boy said, mister, you got yourself a deal. The preacher took the mower and he tried to start it up. You know. He pulled on that cord a few times, he pulled on it more and more, and it just wouldn't start. So the preacher turned and asked the boy why the mower wouldn't start. The boy answered, we have to cuss at it to get it started. <laughs> the preacher said, hey, I'm a minister and I don't cuss. As a matter of fact, it's been so long since I became a Christian that I don't remember how to cuss. <laughs> the boy brightened up and said, y'all just keep pushing up, pulling that cord and it'll come back to you. <laughs> And that's sad truth. You know, no matter how long we've been a Christian, sin is always trying to re-enter into our lives and take over. And sadly, it is all too true how quickly it can come back to us. Today, the text that we're going to look at from Romans chapter 7 relates all too well to the subject of being tempted by sin. And while some have debated whether Paul is talking about himself in verses 14 through 25 or just using the first person singular as an illustration, the one thing that we know for sure is that Old Covenant law, keeping the Old Covenant law, cannot free anyone from, their, from spiritual death. All right? cannot, cannot save you from your sins, cannot uh, keep you from spiritual death. Now that all said, I want to share with you three things briefly before we actually get into our text that I think that most honest Christians can see in those verses. And the first is that when you look at those verses, the text kind of grips you because you kind of understand exactly what he's saying, even though it seems like circular reasoning. <laughs> In other words, we see ourselves in that text. And so we read that and we say, okay, I see you struggling, Paul, and that's me too. I get it. The second thing that most of us see in the chapter, well, in that particular passage, is that this is how the average Christian really does experience the Christian life most of the time. In other words, I don't think that Paul is discussing the life of a person before they became a Christian. And I don't think that Paul is describing the life of an immature or carnal Christian in these verses. I think that he's describing the experience that all Christians face, no matter what their spiritual level is, whether they're rather immature or mature. Anyway, because the truth is... We are all experiencing an ongoing spiritual battle within us. The third thing that, that I believe that most people see in these few verses here is that the spiritual battle that's described here is simply the way it is. In other words, this is the Christian life, meaning that there's no real escape from our ongoing struggle with sin. Remember, we are to live in the world, not of the world. So you could say and go live off in a monastery somewhere. But we all know about the sin of omission as well as the sin of commission. So if you're not doing things that God wants you to do by hiding off someplace, hey, you know what, you're, you're, you've been tempted now to not do things and you've fallen into the trap of sinning anyway. <clears throat> that said, prayerfully, as we mature in our faith, and in our walk with Christ, we should be more
more victorious over the, in those spiritual battles than have defeats. And well, back in Romans chapter 6, we're reminded that we have died to sin. And ahead over in Romans chapter 8, we're told that if we live by the Spirit, we put to death the deeds of the body. Here in Romans chapter 7, and verses 14 through 25, we have described for us that struggle or the conflict or the war. And it's a reality again that we all need to be aware of. That as a follower of Jesus, the struggle is real. Right? And here in our text, Paul lets us know that the problem is not simply the sin on the outside. Again, thinking about our monk friend off somewhere, you know? But the real problem we have to face is sin on the inside. And that means that it's not simply the temptations that are out there, but the temptations that are in here. It's something that we wrestle with daily on the inside. Problem is that as Christians, we sometimes struggle with the idea of struggling with sin. I know that sounds weird, but, you know, because I think sometimes people think, well, shouldn't we be done with that? Or maybe others looking at you think, that, well, you've been a Christian 30 years. Shouldn't you be done with that? And the answer is, well, yeah, I'd like to think so. And while we can overcome the temptations in our life, it's still a challenge. And some more for others than less. It's more of a challenge for others than for other people. All because, again, I see what Paul says here. And if I believe this is really talking about him and the struggles that he faces, he says very plainly in verses 17 and 20, that he's going to deal with some real issues inside him. He says in verse 17, but now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I'm thinking, whoa, how can sin be dwelling in the apostle Paul? And then in verse 20, now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Now, let's get this out on the table. <clears throat> this is the Apostle Paul. And he's not shunning any responsibility for his actions. He's not saying that the devil made me do it because sin is living inside me. All right? He's just reminding us of what every Christian already knows, that while we strive to live by the Spirit... As long as we live in the flesh, we will be tempted. That's just life. But that doesn't mean that we have to sin. We can overcome our temptations and not sin. Now, as we look at our text, keep in mind that the Apostle Paul is openly sharing his own personal struggles here. And as he confesses his struggles, we can also see the different aspects of our own struggles. The first aspect of our ongoing struggle that we can see in our text is the struggle to live up to what we know we ought to be. In other words, the struggle to meet expectations. Starting in verse 15, Paul writes this. He says, for what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good, but now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. And again, I think about this, and I think, why well, the Apostle Paul starts off this little passage here, with an amazing confession saying, I do not understand what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm doing. And I think that we can all relate to that in some way, especially when we have had kids or grandkids, you know, and, and maybe they do something, I don't know, silly. They throw a rock through a window or they break a toy or they whack their sibling in the head or something like that. And you ask them, why did you do that? They said, I don't know. But the thing is, as adults, we're not all that much different. And that's because there are times when we do some things that, that can be described as foolish, 
And oftentimes those foolish things are definitely sinful. And if we're asked why we did it, the only answer that we can somehow manage to come up with is, I don't know. <laughs> why did you go to that place? You know, and why did you click on that website? I, why did you break that promise? Why were you there with that person? It's like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And while we might answer, I don't know, to the question of why, the real answer is, I allowed sin to take over. I made the conscious choice to do wrong. And so Paul admits this too. He says, for what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Again, think about what he's saying. He's letting us know that, hey, the struggle is real. The struggle within his own soul. And that's because there's a continual civil war going on inside his heart. And just like Paul, we often know the good that we ought to do, but we don't do it. And we often know what's wrong to do as well. And so we, we sometimes fight against the good in order to do the wrong, or we struggle with the wrong to try to do the right, and sometimes we say, you know, I will, I will do what's right, and then we don't do what's right. It's kind of like trying to keep that New Year's resolution that you made, baby, at the beginning of the year. It's what, day 15? You think, how many people actually are keeping that resolution? Anyway, we know that the percentage is low. It's just the way it is, though. Sadly, that's the human condition, if you will. Knowing and doing are two different things. We can know the right thing to do, but we can do the wrong thing so easily. And that means that knowing right and wrong isn't enough. There has to be something else, something deeper at work within us. Again, the first aspect of our struggle is living up to those expectations. The second aspect of our ongoing struggle that we can see in our text is to come to grips with repeated personal failure. In other words, the struggle to face failure. Back in our main text, Paul writes in Romans chapter 7 and verses 18 through 20, For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Again back in verse 19 where he says, the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now keep in mind again that Paul was confessing this as an apostle, and as a follower of Jesus Christ. He's not talking about before he became a Christian. He's not talking about a low point. He appears to be talking about this right now. And that's significant because it lets me and you know that if an apostle struggled with these kind of temptations and sins, then I'm not alone. That doesn't mean that it's okay to do but it means that if an apostle can struggle, I can live with my struggles and go to God with the same type of confidence, seeking forgiveness and mercy and guidance from my God. <clears throat> I'm in good, bad company, if you will, with the apostle Paul. I mean, can't you relate when he says he knows the good he wants to do, but he keeps doing the evil that he hates? I, I, I know I can. I mean, I. I I hate to admit it, you know, I see the speed limit, I know the good I have to do, but I don't often obey it. <laughs> that, I think that hits everybody, you know? That's why I mentioned it. <laughs> now, while I believe that every Christian has a deep and honest and holy hatred of sin, just like the Apostle Paul, we all struggle with it. That said, the closer we come to God, the less we will sin. And as we draw near to God, we'll see that actually we are more of a sinner than we thought. 
So it's a little bit of a, I don't say an oxymoron, but as you approach God in your sin to seek forgiveness and to live closer to God, you can see just how much of a sinner you are. But like I said before, many times being a Christian doesn't mean you're perfect, just forgiven. In other words, just because someone's a Christian doesn't make them immune to temptation or immune to the pull of sin. Back in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, Paul said it this way, There is none righteous, no, not one. And then down in the same chapter in verse 23, again we're reminded that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that means that each and every one of us has to deal with the reality of sin while we are living in this world. Along with the reality of the temptations tugging and pulling at us and pushing at us every day. Still there are those who, who try to come up with some kind of a spiritual formula, you know, that's going to kind of get us out of the reality of this text. Something like, well, you know, if you just do A and B and then C, then you're never going to sin again. And while the idea of an easy formula sounds appealing, again, the truth is, the struggle is real. Yeah. But if you want to grow spiritually, if you want to overcome, then that means that it's important for you to come to grips with any repeated personal failures. And that's because the first step in any kind of healing is to admit that you're sick. That's what folks in AA do and other groups like that. The first thing you've got to do is admit you've got a problem. Or else you can't work on the problem because you're denying it exists. You follow? All right, so healthy people don't go to doctors unless you're a hypochondriac. Only sick people do. At the same, thing, at the same time, the same thing is true with each and every one of us, right? Those of us... <coughs> who are made whole by the power of God are those who are not ashamed to admit their weaknesses and their failures and their struggles. Because it's then we can confess to God our difficulties and ask God for his help. Again, the second aspect of our ongoing struggle is to come to grips with repeated personal failure. And the third and final aspect of our ongoing struggle from our text is the struggle to admit the true nature of the war that's going on within us. In other words, the struggle to overcome. Back in our text in Romans chapter 7, this time in verses 21 through 25, <laughs> Paul writes this. He says, I find that a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with, my, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Okay, now there in verse 21, Paul says, I find that a law, that evil is present with me. The one who wills to do good. So again, he's trying to do good, but evil is there with him. I don't know about you, but I think I've said years ago when I first became a Christian, I tried to imagine Jesus sitting next to me as we assembled together in worship. It helped me to focus, all right? Could you just imagine the idea that, okay, Jesus is there, and Satan is here, and Satan is there with you too, and there's this argument going on between them, and you're in the middle, kind of like this idea here, devil on your right shoulder, and, you know, good on your left shoulder. That's how we usually picture this kind of struggle, right? Well, he says it's kind of the way it is. He says, oh, wretched man that I am, right? Think about what Paul just said there. He said that when he wants to do good, evil's right there with him. In other words, he's facing these constant temptations and struggles. 
Now we can debate about what they are. I'm not going to try to you know, go into that and create hypotheticals. No matter what it is, we also face struggles. This spiritual battle that every Christian fights that requires, as Paul wrote before in Ephesians chapter 6, the whole armor of God. We wouldn't need the whole armor of God if we're not in a spiritual battle. We forget that sometimes. We are in a spiritual battle all the time. Get that armor on. And again, what Paul is describing for us here isn't unique to a lost soul, right? And it isn't something that, that, that's special that maybe only persecuted Christians go through. Like maybe Paul was at the time. This evil is waging war against every Christian all the time. And it's a battle that we are going to engage in as long as we live in our physical bodies. Think about it. The most critical battles are not the ones really on the outside of us. They're the ones that are on the inside. Those are the battles, of course, that no one ever usually sees. And that's because we put on our happy face. You know, how you doing? I'm doing all right. You doing okay? Yeah, I'm doing okay. How's it going? Things are great. You know? No one ever usually sees the struggles that we're facing or, or dealing with because we hide that fact. We hide the fact that we're in a battle. We're ashamed. We don't want to admit our own difficulties and the challenges we're facing. But the truth is, behind every smiling face is a story of struggle and heartache and despair or defeat or victory or cowardice and bravery or fear and courage all mixed up together. That's why I've tried to be more patient with road ragers or people that zoom on by thinking, all right, I'm going to try to think the best of this person here. Maybe they're on their way to the hospital, even though the hospital's that way. They're taking the long way around. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So that means even though someone might look good on the outside is the point, we can see, we can only see what's on the outside. We can't see that person's soul. We can't see the struggles effort that they're going through. And so if we really all wanted to be honest with ourselves and to those around us, you know, we would all be admitting the spiritual and emotional and physical struggles that we're going through. And some people here might have been going through a whole lot this past week that you haven't shared, and that's okay. But you know, maybe it's just that you got here by the grace of God because maybe you thought, you know, I'm not going to go this Sunday or something, but you're here. There is a battle going on inside of all of us. And we are struggling in many different ways. And we do tend to not share those things. Here's the thing. If we're going to win more of those battles than lose them, and again, we are going to lose some, and we are going to keep on struggling. We're going to keep on struggling until that final victory comes and the battle is over and we can get to go home and be with God, right? Until then, while we struggle, we can live as overcomers in Christ and be confident knowing that in Christ, we've already won the war as we deal with our day-to-day -day battles. At heart of the matter, really, is our own honesty with God and our ability to confess to one another. And since that's the truth, let me just take a few minutes as we wrap up and uh, offer three suggestions that I believe can help us in our ongoing struggles. And the first thing that helps is honesty. Again, in looking at the last two verses of Romans chapter 7, Paul admits, oh, wretched man that I am. And having to say, Paul, you're the apostle Paul. You're admitting you're a wretched man. He goes, yeah, I'm the chiefest of sinners. I'm a wretched man. And again, while the truth about ourselves can hurt, <coughs> unless we deal with that truth, how can you expect any help? from God or from our brothers and sisters in Christ. All right. The second thing that helps is humility. In that same verse, in verse 24, Paul asks, who will deliver me from this body of death? Think about it again. Honesty says, I'm a wretched man. <clears throat> humility says, 
I can't save myself. I need help. And so whether you're a Christian or not, if we try to win the battle alone without God, well, you're setting yourself up for failure. <clears throat> the third thing that helps is heaven. Honesty, humility, heaven. Following that H thing. Ha. Little alliteration. Ha. In that last verse of verse 25, Paul concludes saying, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so honesty, humility, and heaven. And again, what I mean by heaven is the help that we receive from above, from the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's because our victory in and over sin comes from above, comes from God through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. And so when we understand that, that's why we need to cling to the cross for forgiveness and look to <coughs> Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, to help see us through. Remembering again that forgiveness is the promise for us as Christians in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Again, John is writing to Christians in 1 John, so he's talking about those Christians who struggle with sin. If you confess those sins before God, he will forgive you. But you need to be in Christ, okay? And the help that we receive from God is a promise that we see in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, where the writer reminds us that we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was at all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And again, that's another one of those verses that as I read about Paul's struggle, I think about Jesus and understand, yes, he dealt with temptation and sin, but he did not sin. He dealt with the struggles, but he did not sin. And so I have both of those examples, one to say I'm in good, bad company, and the other to say, you know what, I have Jesus to look to as the example on how to live my life as best as possible, and know that he stands there as my mediator to give me help because he understands the struggles that we go through. And so knowing all that, we need to go ahead and face our ongoing struggle against sin by holding on to heaven with honesty and humility, again, because the struggle is real. You can't deny it. The struggle is real. Now, in all this, again, it's important to remember that we've been talking about Christians struggling and overcoming sin, meaning that if someone is not a Christian, it's impossible to overcome the struggle against sin. Which is why you need Jesus so that you can overcome your struggles. That's why even though they don't always emphasize it, those groups like AA we mentioned earlier, founded upon the principles of God. Without God, there's no way to overcome those struggles. And so, if there is someone who's not a Christian, that person needs to make the choice to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and confess him as Lord and Savior, and then make the commitment to enter into his covenant promise by being immersed in the watery grave for the forgiveness of their sins. And the rising up out of the water of that person is born again to live their life for him until he comes back to claim us or we go to be with him. For those watching online today, again, we want to encourage you that if you have the need to come to Jesus, that you reach out to us and we will go ahead and do what we can to get in touch with you or send someone to talk to you about salvation. For those of us here, as always, if there's anyone who has the need to come forward this morning, we want to encourage you to do that as we stand and sing the song that was selected.
it's really good to see everyone out this morning and uh, hopefully everyone's going to stay, grab a little snack in the back, sit down, chat like we do, and, and just uh, have some good time together. Is there anything else we want to mention before we close in prayer? All right, hopefully everyone's going to stay dry, keep those sandbags high, and uh, we'll get through all this weather together. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you again for being our God and for being merciful to us. We thank you for your Son. And Father, we confess our struggles to you. We confess our need. And Father, we pray that as we evaluate our own life and our own faults, that we'll come to you looking for strength, and for guidance, and for wholeness that we know we have in your Son, Jesus. And Father, as we look to our brothers and sisters who might be dealing with problems, we pray that you will put within us the desire to help one another Continue loving one another as we know that is your will. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.